We are happy. <laughs> All right, awesome. Uh, we're happy to have you in the chat. Uh, please indicate your name, state, grade level, and subject level you teach, or what type of library area you specialize in. My name is Tisha Dunstan. I am the Director of Education for Teaching the Hudson Valley, and we're so happy to partner again with the Southeastern New York Library Resource Council and be able to have Dave join us today. David Serio is an Education and Public Programming Specialist at the Arab American National Museum. He hosts an MA in Near Eastern Studies in Arabic from the, what, the Wayne State University. Mr. Serio joined the AANM in January of 2011. As an educator and public programmer, Mr. Serio conducts educational presentations and workshops for the museum. Um, Mr. Serio also helps in the planning and implement, implementation of youth programs and cultural events, such as the Syria Arts Academy, a youth photography program. Like many of us, he wears multiple hats, including volunteer coordinator and curator of the Aram Film Museum uh, Festival and oversees all subsequent film programming at the AANM. He also proudly serves on the board of the Anton Art Center, the Macomb County Pride, Friends of Detroit Film Theater, and DAFT. On a more personal note, Dave identifies as a third generation Arab American whose family comes from Lebanon. Uh, please feel free to utilize the chat or vocally verbalize your questions or comments but please keep your mics muted unless you're speaking. And with that, we warmly welcome Dave, unless you'd like to say something, uh, Carolyn. Just uh, glad to collaborate with you again and excited to see the program today. Wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, Tisha. Thank you, Carolyn, for having uh, myself and my colleague who is kind of our guest star who will be joining us at the end, Elizabeth Barrett Sullivan, who is the curator of exhibits at the Arab American National Museum. Um, but as Tish mentioned, my name is Dave Serio and I oversee the education department uh, at the Arab American National Museum. And we're really excited to work with you all uh, to really showcase uh, the Arab American National Museum, our resources, and also how we can be of use to you in your classrooms, in your libraries. Um, the great thing with our institution is that we have a lot of um, great opportunities on site, uh, but we also have a lot of great uh, opportunities available for folks who are not physically able to visit the museum. Uh, we had a lot of opportunities pre-COVID, and now we have even more opportunities. Um, you know, now that COVID is here, it, it's allowed us to expand our virtual, our virtual offerings. Um, so what I'd like to do um, is in the chat, and I know you're you're dropping some some information on there. Um, while whilst you're doing that, um, I'm curious to know how many of you are familiar with the Arab American National Museum? How many of you have visited us? Uh, how many of you uh, knew of our existence before today? So I'm curious if you've if you're familiar with us in any way. Okay, I'm seeing a couple no's, which is okay. Okay, okay. So because I'm seeing a lot of no's, which is perfectly fine. Uh, all right, cool. So because not everybody is familiar with our museum and kind of who we are and what we do, I'd like to share um, a short video. And what I'm gonna do basically is I'm gonna go through a brief presentation that'll kind of highlight major areas of uh, what we focus on here at the Arab American National Museum and hence what a lot of our resources focus on, um, but uh, and then kind of go into more of our specifics, uh, into our specific resources that you can access. But I'd like to start with, start with a short video because not everybody's uh, familiar with us. So I'm gonna show you a short video about the museum uh, as soon as this thing lifts, okay. Uh, nope. Yes. So I'm going to show you a, a short video. It's about two minutes long, and I think it'll really encompass um, the Arab American National Museum, who we are, why we exist, and what our role is in the community. So um, if you cannot see my screen or, or hear the sound, please let me know. I have faltered with Zoom before, but um, we should be good to go. So um, we'll watch this short video, and then we'll uh, chat on the other side. Among the 35,000 museums across the United States, there is only one museum that tells our story, and only one museum that elevates the Arab American voice and inspires the generations of today and the generations to follow. A thoughtful narrator of history, 
a passionate advocate of justice and an innovative expression of our identity, the Arab American National Museum has served as the heart of Arab American storytelling, making its mark in the world of art, science, and culture. Brought to life by Access in 2005, the creation of this crown jewel and Smithsonian affiliate was guided by Access's vision of a just and equitable society that includes the full story and contributions of Arab Americans. Emerging as a powerful reclamation of our narrative in a space that has been dominated by ignorance and misconceptions that have threatened our cultures, traditions, and truths, the Arab American National Museum preserves our story and shares our contributions with the world. Locally and across our nation, we offer a history created by you to sustain a future that will be built by you. Since the very beginning of time, storytelling has been a way for us to navigate and discover our world. It is what heals us, unites us, and inspires us. Whether it is stories, songs, paintings, photographs, films, textbooks, novels, or poetry, the beauty and contributions of our unique and remarkable community are captured through the history and art that live on in our treasured Arab American National Museum. All right, so that is just a brief, uh, uh, quick kind of introduction to the Arab American National Museum and again, who we are and, um, you know, why we exist and, and, and all that. Um, and so the, a little bit about our museum. So we are the first and only museum of its kind in the entire country that's dedicated to telling the history, culture and contributions of Arab Americans. Um, and because we're the only institution that does that type of work, that makes us a really essential institution. Um, so uh, I've been with the museum for about 10 years and I've been in edu the education department for the whole 10 years. And one of the reasons that I believe in our institution so much and I, our, our mission is to, to spread this story of Arab Americans um, is because oftentimes like other communities, our story is left out of the larger fabric of history, the text, the typical textbooks, right? And so it's our goal to, to kind of insert the Arab American story into the larger fabric of, of history uh, and communities and cultures and things like that. Um, and there's nothing more satisfying to me as an Arab American to see young Arab American kids, whether they're in our institution or um, it's a virtual program, uh, nothing is more satisfying than seeing them excited by seeing names that they're familiar with, seeing stories that they can directly relate to, seeing items that we have in our collections uh, that they have at their home. And that's something that is so invaluable. And one of the reasons that we exist is to, you know, uh, spread knowledge and understanding about the community, but also be a beacon for, uh, um, for our community to come in and be inspired by and engaged with, um, with our institution. Uh, and so, um, before we jump into kind of some of the content that we talk about in the museum, I always like to start off with a, with a fun icebreaker. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a series of four slides. Uh, on each slide, you're gonna have two images that like such as you see here. Um, I want you to tell me who these people are by name, if you know them by name, or maybe who they are based on their photograph, maybe what position they, what job they hold, you know, uh, what, uh, what, uh, how old they are, what country maybe they come from, any detail you can really think of. Um, so let's start with this, these two. Um, do you recognize either of these individuals? And if so, who are they? Or what can you tell me about them based on the photos? All right, good. This is a pretty easy one. So we have on the right, we have Tony Shalhou, who's a pretty famous actor. Uh, he played in the TV show Monk, if you're familiar. He's also been around for, <clears throat> for quite some time and has a pretty uh, impressive resume, been in lots of TV shows and different movies. Um, so Tony Shalhou is, is Arab American. Uh, and so I'm seeing Claire, you recognize the person on the left, but you don't know how any, any guesses as to like who she, who she might be or what field she might be in. 
Excellent. Great. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, Rashida Tlaib. So she is very much so Michigan based, um, but she's pretty well known in politics. She is uh, Rashida Tlaib. She's a Michigan representative. Uh, she represents Michigan in, in U.S. Congress in, in, our, in Michigan's 13th district, uh, elected in 2019 and continues to serve in, in, in Congress. Um, so both identify as Arab American. Both come from different parts of the Arab world. We have Rashida, who's Palestinian, Tony Shalhoub, who is Lebanese. Um, their families came at different times, immigrated different, at different times to the U.S., but both fit underneath the umbrella of, of Arab American. These are only going to get harder. Uh, so what about these two? You might not know these folks by name, um, but what can you tell me based on their images? And again, it could be anything. All right, excellent. All right, so you're you're right on the money. So the, the person on the right is definitely a journalist working at the, the White House Press Corps. Um, her name is Helen Thomas, a pretty well-known journalist in the field. Um, I believe she interviewed presidents from, was it from Kennedy up until President Obama? So a very, very long career, Lebanese American. Uh, on the right, on the left, any guesses who this guy might be? I see researcher. Any other guesses or thoughts? Very good. So we'll take researcher and scientist and kind of put them together, right? So um, on the left, we have uh, Ahmed Zawil. Oh, sorry, the formatting is a bit funny. Uh, we have Ahmed Zawil, who's an Egyptian American scientist, and he's the first Arab to receive a science Nobel Prize for his work in, in chemistry. And then, of course, on the, on the right, we have Helen Thomas, who, who we just mentioned. So again, both identify as Arab American, come from different parts of the Arab world, which we'll cover in just a moment, um, but both uh, identify as, as Arab American. Okay. What about these two? One might be pretty easy if you're a pop culture uh, junkie and the other one is pretty difficult, but who do you think these folks are? All right, so Lori's on a roll. We have Bella Hadid on the right, right? Maybe uh, definitely a model, right? So we have Bella Hadid, who's pretty familiar in pop culture. She's a supermodel. Uh, she is Palestinian Dutch American, uh, pretty well known. What about the left? I realize this is a very generic photo, but any ideas about the person um, on the left, who she might be? And she's from, I believe she's either from New York or currently, she's currently there in New York, so. No shame with names. <laughs> I, I, I feel that pain. I'm also horrible at names. No clue, no worries. So this is one of the re reasons the museum exists, right? So uh, on the left, we have Debbie Almantazer. She is a Yemeni American educator and activist. She is based in New York City. She's known for her work with interfaith uh, work and, and activism. Uh, you may remember a story of where she opened um, an Arabic school under the name Khalil Gibran, who's also a very famous Arab American, uh, one of the most famous poets uh, in the world. But she opened a school, uh, the Khalil Gibran school, and it came, uh, it was attacked by um, uh, folks who were uh, threw a bunch of stereotypes at the school, basically. We can go into that if you're interested. But so she's pretty well known in education, interfaith, activism, um, and then, of course, Bal Hadid, right? So again, both identify as Arab American, come from different parts of the, of the Arab world, uh, may have different physical characteristics, may dress differently, but both fit under this umbrella of, of Arab American. Lastly, our last slide, any ideas as to who these folks might be based on their background or what they're holding in their hand and in the case on the left. <clears throat> okay, musician's a good guess, singer, okay. Poet, speaker on the left, comedian on the left, comic illustrator on the right. Excellent. Comic book on the right. Absolutely, right? So we hit this right on the head right off the bat. So we have uh, Amr Mohammed Al-Khalifa, better, better known by his stage name Odyssey, who is a Sudanese-American rapper. 
and record producer based in New York, again, uh, who's been making music since the early 2000s. Uh, and then Jeff Johns on the right, who we can assume, and who some folks had mentioned that he is involved in the comic book world. Uh, he's worked on, um, he's worked for DC Comics and worked on comics such as Green Lantern, Aquaman, Flash, and Superman. So again, both are pretty well known in their respective fields. Um, again, both come from different parts of the Arab world. We have Sudan and Lebanon. Uh, both have different physical characteristics, are in different industries, but both fall under this uh, umbrella category of being identifying as Arab American. Um, and so what does that mean, right? And so this is a map of the Arab world. Um, this is a map that is, uh, can be accessible for educators uh, if they're interested in utilizing uh, this map. Um, but this map showcases the 22 different countries that are considered to be uh, Arab countries. You can see they stretch across a really large swath of territory from northern Africa all the way into southwestern Asia. Um, and uh, we, well, there's a couple things with this map, right? So the first is that we don't utilize, we don't use the term Middle Eastern. Uh, it's not um, insulting to call somebody from this part of the world Middle Eastern, um, but it's just not the most accurate if we're talking about Arabic related things like food or clothing and whatnot. The term Middle East is something that was really coined by the British. And so when Britain was ruling the world, they kind of sectioned off the world as they saw it in relation to themselves. And so um, Middle East happens to involve Southwestern Asia, but includes countries like Iran and Turkey uh, and really ignores most of the North African countries. So if we're talking about, you know, inclusion, uh, you know, especially with the with this in relation to this map, uh, we don't use the term Middle East because it excludes most of the North African countries. And it includes countries like Iran and Turkey that are Middle Eastern by geographical definition, but are not Arab countries, right? Uh, and so this map is really super helpful to identify what part of the world we're talking about when we're talking about Arab uh, Arab countries. Um, and there are three unifying factors that unify those 22 countries together. Um, there is Arabic as an official language, uh, a shared history and culture, and then membership in the League of Arab States or, or the Arab League for short. And so these three reasons are exactly why these 22 countries are considered to be Arab, whereas Iran and Turkey are not considered to be Arab countries because they speak a different language, have a different historical and cultural connection, and they're not members of, of the Arab League. Um, so when we do presentations, when we do uh, vir tours, virtual or in-person, we really spend a lot of time unpacking this map. There's a lot with this map. Um, we talk about the unifying factors. We talk about Middle East versus Arab world. Uh, we also talk about um, layers of identity. So you'll have many, many folks who live in these 22 countries that don't necessarily identify as, as Arab. And so we talk about how, you know, there's different layers of identity. And again, if we're being inclusive, we, we really try to stress that, you know, when introducing materials, we don't assume that, you know, uh, the folks that we're, we're talking about um, or the, the folks we're talking to identify as Arab, right? A great example is the music you heard when you were coming in, El, El Sara and the Nubatones. The lead singer doesn't identify as Arab per se, but she comes from an Arab uh, country. And Elizabeth, correct me if I'm wrong, I could be wrong on that. But so we represent folks who may not identify as Arab themselves, but come from the Arab countries and may share cultural uh, connections. So we always uh, tell folks to not uh, automatically assume somebody's identity as Arab, but um, better to have these, these, these conversations. And so you have many communities in a lot of these countries that don't identify as Arab, um, but you know, um, still come from the Arab countries and, and, and you know, may speak Arabic, may know about the culture, but may have other cultures and, and languages that they connect with. Um, so some folks identify as Arab from these communities, some don't. A lot of it, it's, it's a very personal choice. And that's something we really focus on in our tours and presentations that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we also talk about Arab immigration to the United States. Uh, we won't spend a ton of time just for, 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 for time's sake with this, with this uh, program, but we really focus on four distinct time periods in which Arabs immigrated to, um, to the um, United States. Uh, and again, this is something that we really focus on because again, if you look at history books, if you look at the, the major textbooks or, or a lot of resources, they often don't talk, they don't focus on the Arab American story, again, like other communities uh, as well. And so again, our goal is really to insert the Arab American story and fit it in with the larger fabric um, of history, right? So for example, a lot of people don't realize that Arabic uh, folks, uh, Arab, uh, Arab uh, immigrants have been coming to the country since uh, the 1880s. And you have other Arabic speakers 
who came way, way long ago, even as far back as the slave trade in the 1500s, as enslaved individuals, they may not have identified as Ar being Arab, but they were still Arabic speakers. And so there's still kind of that connection. Um, and so again, we really try to showcase that Arabic uh, speaking folks and Arab immigrants have been coming to this country for, for quite some time by different means. Um, and so we break it down into four distinct time periods uh, about who's coming, why folks are coming over. Uh, we also tie this in with uh, US history in general. Um, so a lot of times we'll tie the, the, the beginnings and the ends of these time periods to what's going on politically in the US. So for example, the end of the first time period uh, really of immigration uh, really ends because the US puts policies in place that really restrict Arab immigration among other communities, but really stops Arab immigration from uh, at this time. Uh, certain policies that are put into place like literacy tests and quota systems that really uh, do not allow Arab immigrants, and again, many other communities from coming to the US. And so we tie a lot of the Arab American stories into US history. So there's a lot of really great connection points with our content uh, that goes to many different subjects. So geography, history, um, so on and so forth. Um, our third and fourth time period, just to give you a glimpse, is from the mid 1960s until the 90s. And the fourth time period is from the 90s up until present day. Uh, and so again, you can see various reasons why, why people are coming over. We've also created really wonderful activities that we can talk more about that go along with these time periods. So for example, we have a, a suitcase activity where um, we'll ask uh, groups to, uh, you know, if you had to leave your country or your house tomorrow, you could pack up to seven items in your suitcase, what would you take with you? And why would you take these items with you? Um, and that's a really great exercise for groups to understand that, you know, it's really difficult to leave your home behind, especially when you can't bring your whole family, your whole house. Uh, and so our goal is really to give various perspectives um, of the Arab American story. Uh, and I'm just seeing from the chat, Claire, that, that quote at the bottom, that's something that we really try to incorporate. There's this idea that, you know, and it's, very true to a large extent that a lot of folks are very excited to come over to the US to start a new life and to uh, you know, uh, live the economic dream and all that. But then there are other folks who don't have the choice of coming over, um, you know, distinguishing between a refugee and an immigrant who, who long to come, you know, many refugees long to go back to their homeland, but they're forced out. Uh, and so again, we really try to show a full perspective of, of the community. Uh, we also hit on laborers and entrepreneurs. So one of the major reasons so many Arab Americans came to uh, Metro Detroit is because of the auto industry for, for jobs more broadly, more specifically the auto industry. Uh, and you'll find that a lot of um, community, uh, a lot of uh, Arab immigrants, when they came here, went to major cities like New York, uh, like Boston, and like Detroit because of uh, economic opportunities uh, and jobs. And so for Detroit, it was the auto industry. Uh, and then from there, we had entrepreneurship, people owning grocery stores and businesses. Um, in, in fact, in the 1920s, there were at least 300 grocery stores in the city of Detroit alone, owned and operated by Arab Americans, which is a huge number in one specific city. Um, we also cover things such as uh, stereotypes, right? And uh, for time's sake, I won't spend too much time on this, but you can see snapshots as to how the community is often perceived. And again, this is one reason why the museum exists is to really unpack uh, these stereotypes, right? Really quickly, what are some thing, what are some images that are jumping out at you? What's what's some of the what are the major themes you see amongst all of these pictures? Okay, good. Sexualization and fetish, fetish, fetishization. Um, exotic women, specifically women in general. Yep, absolutely. Right. So there's a theme with this, right? And so again, this is one of the reasons the museum exists is to unpack these stereotypes. There's a lot of stereotypes when it comes to women, uh, the sexualization of Arab women uh, being shown either as very seductive um, or the, the quite the opposite of that, right? And so this is an example. We have a stereotypes room in our exhibit where we really unpack um, these stereotypes. And we spend, we do a lot of workshops and a lot of interactive workshops, really uh, understanding these stereotypes, unpacking them, and then coming up with solutions about how we can be an ally to the Arab American community when it comes to these stereotypes, either 
finding and learning about them in films that you can see a lot of these are film related or book related, media related, right? Um, or just in conversations that we have. Uh, Chris, good observation as well, dominant males as well. So kind of the, the hyper sexualization, the hyper macho Arab man, that's also something that we see in a lot of films. Uh, so that's also really important to, to note. Um, another example here, uh, we see other examples of how Arabs are portrayed in film. What are some major pieces and themes you're seeing in, in these images? Right, the bad guy, the bad guy, the villain, a lot of violence as well. Absolutely, right? So, and a lot of these, we can see weapons, we see knives and guns and, and, and bombs and, and even a, a young child uh, holding a gun, right? We see stereotypes such as, again, the beards, uh, the camels. Um, and so again, we, again, Arabs are tend to be seen in, in two different lights in, in film, uh, in, in media and in films as either, you know, mysterious, exotic, sexualized, or as violent, dangerous, uh, anti-Western, whatever the case is. So again, we spent a lot of time really doing specific workshops, uh, unpacking stereotypes, where these come from. And we, a lot of our offerings, which we'll get into in just a moment, are very interactive, where we ask questions, we have critical thinking, um, we do breakout rooms so that people can uh, get to the answers without us having to like spoon feed it and like just lecturing at them. Okay. Um, of course, the problem with this is this results in, into hate crimes, uh, into violence against the community. Um, and so this, this is one, this is again, one reason why the museum exists is to again, you know, uplift the Arab American voice, dispel stereotypes and empower the community, which is what you're seeing here, you know, empowering the community, being involved in activism, protests, uh, peaceful protests, um, getting involved, you know, creating youth groups, being associated with different organizations. Um, and again, a celebration of Arab culture, arts, music, um, and again, educational resources, right? So this is kind of the second part of my presentation, uh, and then I'm gonna pass it over to Elizabeth. So the museum has some really, really excellent resources um, available to uh, educators. And so, uh, you know, whether you're in the classroom, in the library, or wherever you're really at, we have a lot of really great resources for you all to utilize. So I'm gonna jump out of here and show you a couple of different pages and, and resources that we have. Um, and then I think we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end for questions, if you all have questions, but if, if there's anything that comes to mind, you can also drop it into the chat and we can, we can talk about it. So there's a couple of things here on our website. Our website is one of our best resources to utilize. There's a few um, really invaluable resources. The first one, and something that's very new, uh, well, within, within a year, I think, of being created, um, is our core galleries, right? And this is on the museum's website, which I'll drop into the chat once Elizabeth starts, just to, um, I, I'm very bad at multitasking sometimes. So I'll drop that in the chat afterwards. But if you go to the museum's website, ArabAmericanMuseum.org, um, it'll take you to all of our resources. And our core galleries is a really great place to, to start. So it highlights our four core gallery spaces. And if you click on one of them, um, oh, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, if you click on one of them, you'll it'll take you to the page and you'll get uh, a, uh, a version of myself. Uh, so on this page, you'll see you know, a, a virtual tour, um, which we'll talk about in just a moment, but a virtual tour introduction to the exhibit. And you can click on this and it'll, it'll be a quick two minute uh, introduction to the exhibit and what can you, what can you, what you can expect. Uh, and then there'll be some text and it again, breaks down the different time periods, kind of who's coming, why folks are coming. Um, and then there's items from our collection that Elizabeth will explain, but you can click on it. And it'll take you to our collections page, which Elizabeth will cover uh, pretty extensively. So there's items to click on that'll take you to our collections page. Um, again, it, it breaks it down into different waves, uh, diff the four different time periods. Again, additional videos, um, more videos of myself. It's very narcissistic, I feel like. Uh, and then it'll, um, and again, there's different links. So um, it'll take you to um, learning about, again, specific families uh, in our collections. And then it also provides some resources, right? So again, if you're a teacher and you want to do this activity, I had mentioned the suitcase activity, you can click on this and it'll take you to our, one, of our, uh, one of our activities. And it'll give you an, un, you know, an understanding of why this, what this activity is, the directions. Uh, it'll even give you a, <clears throat> uh, some questions to ask after 
uh, the students do their, their drawing exercise after they draw the items in their suitcase. Um, and then we give you a template. And then we can we even give you some examples of different items from our collection that you can uh, click on. And, and these are also clickable images that'll take you to um, our, our collections. So again, this is just one resource that's available to, uh, to teachers. Uh, and you'll find that uh, also it ties to our lesson plans, which I'll share in just a minute. Um, but again, you'll find examples like this in our um, in all of our other core galleries pages. So really, really great resource. Um, another great resource is our four educators tab, um, and it highlights a ton of additional resources that that we offer. So it does link to the virtual galleries, which we, we just went over. It also links to our lesson plans. So if you click here, you'll find a wide variety of lesson plans, all you know for covering K through twelve schools. Oh, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, you'll find lesson plans that, that connect with K through 12 schools, um, some specifically for elementary, some for specifically middle school and high school. Um, really excellent lesson plans, uh, very digestible, very engaging. Um, we also have a culture box that's available. It's a box that uh, can be shipped uh, and is available to educators for free. Uh, it includes musical instruments, literature, educational items, a map of the Arab world, uh, and a lot of other things, which is which is a really great resource. Um, you can stay up to date with our open houses, professional development, and, and workshops that are done both in person and now online. Um, you can connect to, and I'll, I'll cover these in just a moment, uh, but you can connect also with um, our educational booklet, which is super, this, this is one of my favorite resources that we've actually created. It's a 52-page online booklet and again, it encompasses a lot of what I what I talked about. So history, waves of immigration, uh, culture, food, uh, reasons why people are coming over, the Arab world map, um, stereotypes, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. And this is a great resource that's downloadable, which is free. Uh, if you're interested in hard copies, that is something also that the museum uh, can ship to you all. Um, but again, it's just a really great resource, has really up-to-date information. Um, again, real, a lot of really great pictures, you know, unpacking what the Arab world is, how it differs from the Middle East. So this is a really great uh, resource that educators can utilize in their, uh, in their classrooms. Um, we also have traveling exhibitions. Uh, and um, if you have questions on this, we can talk about this. But um, one thing that the museum did uh, right before uh, COVID-19 hit is we created a traveling exhibit that is basically created with eight quick screen banners. Um, and it's basically a, the museum in traveling form. Uh, and we've had a lot of libraries successfully host this exhibit. We have had schools as well. And the idea is that they're eight quick screen banners. And again, they showcase the major uh, contents of the museum. So again, there's a map of the Arab world. There's Arab Americans who've made an impact. There's the four time periods of immigration. There's culture, food, uh, different things like that. And it's a great, um, a great resource for libraries to showcase, for school classrooms to showcase. Um, with Arab American Heritage Month uh, officially being, uh, not created, but, uh, but as April is officially designated Arab American Heritage Month, this is a really excellent way to bring the museum into your space if you're, if you're not, of course, within the Metro Detroit area. So that's a really great resource that we have. Um, a few other resources that we, that we also have is um, some of our virtual tours. So we do, um, have live guided virtual tours of our exhibit where we take an, an iPad uh, and we'll kind of walk through the exhibits where folks can get a, an in-depth look at um, our collections and our space. Um, we also have a virtual tours uh, package. This is something that's really interesting. Um, there's a lot of content here, so I will not bore you with everything, but I'll just give you a snapshot. So it has our three core galleries, our Coming to America, which focuses on immigration, Living in America, which is more Arab American culture, and making an impact which highlights uh, famous Arab Americans who've made an impact on society. Uh, and so we'll go into living in America first and you'll find a lot of different resources. And so for example, you can access our lesson plans and they're, they're kind of sectioned off here. Um, there is an assessment. So in here you'll find a quiz that you can implement in your classroom if you'd like. There are a ton of resources. So again, our, our Arab world map is here for folks to utilize. Um, we have items from our collection, again, that are clickable that you can uh, go into our collections. We have a uh, different resources, so a bunch of videos, a bunch of um, texts, oops, texts and books that, that can, oops, sorry, please go away. 
please go away. Okay, okay, that's not helpful. Sorry. Um, so there's a lot of applicable videos and, and literary resources you can use. We also uh, um, help educators use techniques like visual thinking strategies where folks basically look at several images and unpack that based on what the students are seeing, which eventually will kind of get ideally to the to the proper uh, message you're trying to convey. So we have an educational toolbox for visual thinking strategies. Uh, and then we also have a bunch of activities. So we have um, for example, we have our kitchen activity. This is kind of like the suitcase activity where uh, students go home, they go into their fridge and they draw up to five different items uh, that they have in their fridge. And the idea is to talk about different cultural items you may have in your home. You know, you may have similar items, like we all have eggs. Most of us have eggs, uh, milk, cheese, bread, things like that. But, you know, there are also cultural items that you'll find, right? So many Arab Americans will have um, a pot for making yogurt. Many Arab Americans may have an endless supply of hummus uh, in their fridge. Um, they may have leban or yogurt uh, canned in their fridge. So the idea is, you know, again, to showcase that, you know, we have a lot of different items that many other folks have, but we also have a few different unique pieces that make us uniquely uh, Arab American. So lots of different activities, pre-teaching exercises available. And then lastly, our introduction page. So this is really helpful. We have a how to use the virtual tours. We recognize this is a huge uh, piece, a lot of materials. And so we have a step-by-step -step, um, guide as to how we would recommend using it, right? So here's, we would recommend starting off with the pre-teaching activity, going into part one of the tour. So if you click on here, it'll take you to a pre-recorded guided tour of the museum. Uh, so we have pre-recorded guided tours of, of the exhibits, then doing the activity and so on and so forth. Uh, and then again, the introduction just lists, you know, what students will be able to achieve and accomplish with this specific section. And again, all of the resources are linked here. So here are uh, the four sections of the virtual tour, all the activities, the lesson plans, so on and so forth. Um, so I recognize that's a lot of information, but the great thing with this is, is that you can utilize this in your classroom or in your, your respective space as you want to, right? So you can use this Living in America lesson plan for the next three months if you want to, or you can do it in one week. So it's a really great way for you to have access to resources and for you to utilize them at your own leisure versus like a one day guided tour of the museum. So it's just an, a different option. Um, again, I realize I'm throwing a lot at you. So apologies if your, your eyes are glazing over, but I'm just gonna show a couple more resources and then share it over with, uh, bring it over to Elizabeth. Um, so we have different resources available online. So if you go to YouTube and look up the Arab American National Museum. We have our, our story time uh, that is all online. Um, so this is, for example, is a recorded story. Uh, it's Arabic English story time. So it's a bilingual story where we have our storyteller, Sari, who is reading the story in Arabic and in English. Um, and a lot of the books are thematic, right? So we have the I Have a Dream, which is perfect for uh, Martin Luther King Day, which recently passed, perfect for Black History Month. Uh, and so you can use this video and you'll hear him reading the story in Arabic and in English, which is a really excellent resource. We also have from the archives, which I think Elizabeth will, will touch on, um, where we utilize, and I'll, I'll show like just a minute of this, because uh, I realize that I'm going over. Um, but the idea is we utilize items from our collection to tell stories. And again, a lot of it is thematic. So we'll just watch just a, a minute of this and then I'll jump into my last resource. Welcome to From the Archive. My name is Iman Saleh, your host, and today we have Alyssa, the archivist from the museum. So Alyssa is going to talk to us today about Valentine's Day. Yeah, we pulled out a couple of items about Valentine's Day or love in general from the archives. Um, we've got some really cool stuff to talk about today. So let's start with this book. What do we have here? So this is a scrapbook from one of the families that donated. It's got some really cool stuff about their lives throughout um, about a couple, about a decade's worth of time. Um, birth announcements, weddings, photographs. But I also found in here this really cute little Valentine's Day that says, For Mother, Happy Valentine's Day with all my love. And it's got a little poem, and it's signed Billy, which I think is a really adorable little card to your mom. Um, very nice handwriting, possibly signed by dad. <laughs> and how old was Billy when? 
I, I, based on the birth announcement in the scrapbook, only a year or two. Oh, so it's signed by a parent. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, and what about this little card? So there are other Valentine we found in the collection, also to a family member, um, which says, I'm not kitten, I really want to be your Valentine. Love a good Valentine's pun. This one is written to grandmother from Ali. So another one to a family member. We actually don't have any Valentines that I could find um, for romantic partners. So just a quick snapshot again of like how some of these uh, videos could be utilized in your uh, in your classroom or uh, whatever uh, setting you might find yourself in. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is this is one of my favorite resources that we have. It's our digital scrapbooks. Um, and this is a really great way, again, if you want to tell the story of the Arab American community or get some snapshots, at least, this is a really excellent resource. And you can find you can see that we have quite a few of them. Uh, here and we're always adding to them. So if you know of anybody who's interested in recording their digital, doing a digital scrapbook, uh, feel free to contact myself or Elizabeth. Um, but we'll play just a minute of this, just so you can kind of get a feel for what this, uh, what the digital scrapbooks are all about. My name is Estat Deraise, and I live in Flint, Michigan. This short digital story is about how my father, Ibrahim Deraise, came to the U.S. and started his own business. I chose this first picture of my grandparents because not only do they look great, but also to symbolize the beginning of where my father came from before he immigrated to Michigan. My grandparents raised five boys and one daughter, all of whom also immigrated to the U.S. except for the daughter. My father and late grandmother, Hlal, this was in the late 60s, early 70s. My dad would visit Jordan every year or two. This was before he got married and had children. My family in the early 80s going to Jordan for one of their visits. In the picture is my father, Ibrahim, my sister Suzanne, my brother Omar, and behind them my eldest brother, Barakat. We fast forward here to a picture in Ramtha, Jordan, at our home. We were cooling off in the water with my other grandfather, Muhammad, my mother's father, and my siblings. My mother, aunts, and I visiting Bedouin family friends in El Mafrag. My father and I picking fruit in our front yard in Jordan during the 90s. He was visiting for a few weeks from Michigan at the time. The picture of my father in the golf cart is with my late uncle Ali, who is the oldest of the brothers and who's also the reason for why they all immigrated and started their own businesses. He came to the U.S. first and then he encouraged the rest of his brothers to follow. And they did. My father first came to the U.S. in 1967. Among the places he and his brothers worked before entering into the small business sector were General Motors and Citizens Bank. But after seeing how successful... Okay, so I think, I think you get the point, but again, some really, really great resources at your, at your fingertips. Um, a lot of youth uh, activities that we offer as well. We do a lot of, virt again, virtual tours. We have object-based learning. We teach traditional dance, which is really cool. Um, so lots of really great resources, and I would love to uh, give you all, give your ears a break from my voice, uh, and welcome Elizabeth Barrett-Sullivan, who is the curator of exhibits uh, from the Arab American National Museum, to tell you a little bit more about some of these primary resources, specifically about our Library Research Center and um, our collections. So Elizabeth, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dave. There you go. Hi everyone, um, I'm Elizabeth Barrett Sullivan and I'm the curator of exhibits at the museum and um, I have been with the museum about 14 years. Um, my family also has connections to the Arab world on my mother's side, we are Syrian. Um, so Dave and I both have special um, special connection to the museum. It's, dear, it's near and dear to our hearts and we're um, so glad that we can share it with you um, and share the stories of our collections. Um, so we, use the term um, permanent collections and core exhibits quite purposely. The items that, that are in our collection are you know, permanently ours. They're part of, uh, part of um, become part of our collection. And the exhibits we, we used to call um, our permanent exhibits, but we realized that gives the impression that they never ever change, but they actually do change. Um, the, the, the stories within them, the themes within them sort of remain um, that should remain the same, but um, as we know, the immigration story is still continuing today, and we are continuing to collect those stories. We are continuing to add them to our core exhibition spaces and to 
you know, we, we use them in our programming and um, in all of our resources and such. So um, just to give you a little bit of background on our um, collection, our holdings, um, we have about 5,000 objects and photographs and about 220 -year linear feet of archival material. Um, as Dave said, we are, we are really the only institution that is collecting this wide swath of material. So we have household items and um, you know scholars' material and um, just a huge range. So I'll I'll go through. I'll give some examples of what we have and how you can find those things. How you can possibly use them in your lessons um, as we go on. So everything we collect is connected to basically one of our, our core um, exhibition thematic areas. We really focus on the American side of, of the story. So something that might come from the Arab world, but you know, was brought by an immigrant family um, or was yeah, saved, <laughs> saved in, the, in the US, that somehow that American connection um, is really the story that we are telling at our institution. We get a lot of people expect us to have a lot of old like Islamic art and Arab world um, material. And we do have some of that in order to tell the story of where Arabs come from and who they are um, before they uh, migrate to the US. Um, but really the core of our, our mission is, is to focus on the, um, the American connection to our story. Um, so those are the, the core galleries, which I linked to um, that you can explore those uh, virtual galleries. Um, we're excited to have those and explore some of the objects in there. We have um, in our, um, on our website, um, in our learn and collections and research tab, we have our th three main um, catalogs. So the first one, um, the object collection is um, our past perfect um, and database and that's where, <laughs> I tell you this so that I can keep it straight when I talk to you, but it really doesn't um, <laughs> matter. But um, so we have our the first one, the object collection is is from is hosted by Past Perfect, and they that is really where we have the bulk of the material. Um, I'll, I'll show you some examples in a second, but um, really all of the objects and photographs and some examples of our um, archival material. The special collection one in the middle that is hosted by Content DM. And that is where we are able to share primary digitized primary resources um, much more directly. So we can digitize full books and host them there um, if you're in the public domain or you know, huge amounts of correspondence and other material from um, some of our special collections. And then lastly, we have our library and research center. Um, that is, uh, you know, we have, we're connected to Downlat. Um, we are the single largest collection of materials by and about Arab Americans in there, are roughly 4,000 books, um, ranging from literature and scholarly works to, we have a cookbook collection and a comic book collection, um, and we're continuing to grow that material as well. Um, uh, yeah, we're a member of the, the Dalnet, which is um, Detroit Area Library Network. Um, and, uh, I think the ALA too, <laughs> um, we are currently without a librarian and I don't speak about it super well, um, but we, um, we have a book award as well. Um, I can't remember how many years we've done the book award. It's like the 15th year, 16th year, something like that. Um, and so uh, that is run by our library program too. Uh, any uh, um, author who was written by or about Arab Americans can submit their work um, every year. And we have a panel of peer reviewers who um, review the different categories and um, you know, present awards every year. Um, so this is our this is our objects and photos database called Past Perfect. Um, it gives you pretty, pretty basic search um, um, capabilities. We have some tips there. You can search by keyword. You can do. You can make activities that are a little bit more in depth. Um, on the right there is an example of an object record that would come up if you searched for the artist's name. Um, this is a piece by um, Saudi um, American artist Hendel Mansour. She lives in Wisconsin. Um, here's a little bit better photo of it. <laughs> um, 
uh, we had a, an exhibition of her work in 2018 called Mihrab, and she incorporates a lot of different Arab and Islamic motifs into her work, but she also bucks tradition where she does use figures in her work where traditionally Muslims do not um, use figures in their work. Um, but a lot of her work is based on like the Abrahamic religions stories, um, and she draws connections between the different religions as well to, to draw these stories and underlying themes of feminism as well in her work. So in the um, object record, you'll see there that we have, we try to always include like an artist statement and as much information as we can about um, each thing that we have. Um, is a work in progress. I have spent a lot of time um, filling out the, the catalog to be a little bit richer um, and hopefully the things that <laughs> the things that I'll talk about next kind of um, uh, enrich the experience and can be used um, in different projects. So we started just recently in the last two years, um, really utilizing the tag feature so that we can connect all of our objects to each other. So this on the left, um, a little snippet of this um, photograph of, of um, Farouk Albaz who was a geologist and worked for NASA. And he's talking to, um, he's talking to uh, Anwar Sadat about the ter terrain on Mars. Um, so we've tagged both Egypt and Mars and you can go and look at the other objects in our collection that may relate to those things. So here we've got Egypt um, highlighted and the other objects. So Egypt might lead you to these scent um, perfume bottles. Um, that came from our artist in residence um, of August of last year, Zaina Al Masri. She donated these to us. She's someone who works in scent culture. She's a perfumer by trade. Um, she had led some very great um, workshops locally. The was it Yella Smell? I think we called it. Um, she led a smell tour of Dearborn and found you know different herbs growing around our city and stuff that people can smell um, and. It's it's interest. It just shows the the wide range of things that we have in our collection, um, from photos to these um, these bottles. So we also have, um, as I mentioned, um, the American connection of, uh, of of our objects. So on the left is a bread mold that came from Yemen, um, and on the right is a photograph from our archives of a local woman, Fatima Bumrad, who is using something very similar that she made herself. Um, and she's putting the dough that would have been on the rounded side of that bread mold um, on the left onto the hot um, oven called a saj. Um, so we have this very traditional sort of side and also the modern how people, we're making that connection to how people continue their traditions, live in a modern world here um, and all that. Here's another example. I just like talking about bread. So <laughs> another example where this bread paddle was created in the US um, so that the family who lived in Utah um, could make Lebanese bread um, in their home, in their own home oven. And it's still, we have it in our collection and it still has flour on it. And it's, it's just a, a little, great little resource. Um, our special collections catalog called Content DM as I mentioned, allows us to do, um, allows us to share our re primary resources um, and they're each separated into um, special collections. Um, so the Arab Heritage Month one that is, you can see there on the, it's sort of in the middle there. Um, that one has all of the proclamations that we've collected over the last three or four years of different mayors and politicians who have begun recognizing April as Arab American Heritage Month. Um, and we have personal archival collections as well, like Evelyn Shacker and Emil Abu Samra, who are listed there. They have, you know, each each has a focus about who those people are and what they what they did. And the assets are downloadable. Um, you can read them in browser. There's video and audio and um, as text material, and we're working on um, beefing up our oral history collection and having transcripts in there so that it's really accessible. That's really our goal um, with these. One of our um, 
collections that I'll end on is our jewelry collection that came from a collector in um, um, who was a diplomat and um, collected a lot of jewelry material from all over the Arab world. And she created an exhibit called Silver Speaks. Um, and we actually hosted that exhibit in 2008. And then a couple years ago, she donated the entire collection to us. So we have this huge jewelry collection as well. And as you can see, you know, we got these beautiful um, color photographs and you can learn about the different um, material right within those records. Um, and yeah, so Dave mentioned <laughs> from the archives and our digital scrapbooks already, so I won't go into those, but um, we're continu continuously collecting. We have, you know, finding aids and bibliographies that might not necessarily be on our website yet. We're still beefing up those things, but we are available to, you know, take whatever research requests you might have um, and, um, and, you know, help you find the material, create your own um, uh, activity that if you want to do, like, I know <laughs> some teachers like to teach their um, students how to use search engines and how to use a different catalog and find the thing that they're looking for. We're here to help with that. We've done that with other um, classes as well. So um, that's that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, before I forget, I'm gonna drop both of our emails into the chat in case people would like to copy and paste into their computers. Um, uh, but yeah, so um, that kind of concludes, I think, uh, our part of the conversation. Um, I dropped our emails into the chat. If you all have any questions or would love to contact us, we are certainly here to help, uh, you know, with anything we can do. And I really hope you see the Arab American National Museum as a resource for you and your uh, community members. Um, we're happy to take any questions. Does anybody have any questions or any, even if it's not a question, any source that you found to be particularly useful during our conversation? Um, hello, my name is Mamie Yang. I'm a librarian on Long Island. Um, I've never heard of your museum. It's fascinating. We have, um, I would like to try to bring this to the attention to my teachers. So I will definitely be exploring your, um, the resources, it's, it's just amazing. Ah, thank you very much. Yeah, and if you want, we're happy to do, uh, you know, workshops or it's very similar to what we just did right now for your respective school districts, communities, whatever the case is. So feel free to, to keep us in mind. Great, thank you. My pleasure. Any other thoughts or comments before we conclude? I do have one other question. Okay, sure. sorry, this is Mamie again. Um, you have such a vast amount of resources. How are you funded? Ooh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I might need Elizabeth's help with this uh, or Elizabeth to correct me, but I'll take a step. I'll take a guess, uh, or I'll take. I'll tell you what I what I think I know. Um, so most of our funding comes from a couple different places. Uh, grants are a huge uh, source of income for us. Um, that's how you know um, we were able to do a lot of you know updates to the museum, provide a lot of educational uh, tours. So we we've applied for different grants that allow us to do free tours and you know half day workshops for students uh it's a lot grants have allowed us to like do some updates to the exhibits uh including you know adding young learner content so grants are a huge part of it uh donations uh and memberships are also a huge part of it um you know it's really the community members who really keep us afloat and and their buy-in and support of the museum is really what keeps us operating um and then also from different corporations so like ford gm um but a lot of those are donate a lot of those are like corporate giving but go to specific programs so a lot of businesses will give us money and it'll be for educational tours or it'll be for collection of oral histories and, and scrapbooks and things like that um elizabeth am i missing anything 
No, that's, yeah, that's pretty much it. Basically all of our collections are donated. We purchase very little. It's usually just like incidental things that we actually purchase. Um, we've started purchasing artwork and being able to commission artwork thanks to some funding from um, different sources. The Andrew W. Mellon Foundation was one that just gave us a lot of money to, to grow our arts um, side of things. We've been hosting the, I mentioned the artist in residence program um, briefly. Um, that's something that you know we're really proud of and continue um, to to expand. But yeah, we we really rely on the community and um, you know the funding sources for to keep us um, going and the passion of our staff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that I speak for all of us when I say we're sorry you don't have a librarian right now. <laughs> that's a bummer. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we, we did have a librarian, but she left us for a, a public um, library job position that she was very excited about. So we can't blame her, um, but we will be hopefully hiring another one as soon as possible. If you have candidates, uh, you know, keep an eye out for our um, our open position. Um, and yeah, we are we are we have a special library, so it's it's a little. Um, um, not everyone is used to working in such a small, like specialized library, um, but it's really fun. The things we get to do are really great. And, um, you know, connecting with the community and collecting direct from those sources um, is really um, fulfilling and, and um, fulfill, yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, okay. and there's so much you can get online. I mean, it's just amazing because you've got the different um, platforms. and Yeah. It's great. We try to be as accessible as possible. How many staff members do you have then? That is a good question. Right uh -huh. now, not enough. <laughs> not enough. Is it fifteen? Is that right? Is that too many? I can't remember. I say, are we up to fifteen now? I haven't counted recently. If we're counting our comm staff, because okay, so I, I don't know that Dave mentioned that we have a larger organ parent organization called Access. Um, they were a social services um, organization that was founded in the 1970s in the southeastern end of Dearborn um, as, you know, civil rights activists. And there were things within the neighborhood um, that, um, you know, really formed, uh, was the impetus for them to form a coalition and form this organization that has survived for 51 years now. Um, and um, we share, we still share some staff with them, um, but the museum is one of their three core, um, they call them projects <laughs> or programs. Um, but so it's mm -hmm. us and then a philanthropic um, um, branch and also a, a national network of other Ar Arab American organizations across the country. So we have, I think it's 31 members of that network um, in like 11 states or something like that. And I'm, I'm, there's definitely some in New York. And one last thing I, I should mention too, um, uh, if you're interested in staying connected to the museum, so we typically send out monthly e-blasts that just lists everything that we have coming up. So a lot of, you know, like we were saying, a lot of our stuff is accessible online. That includes a lot of our public programming. Uh, and so we do have like, you know, virtual film screenings, we have poetry readings, we have um, wor workshops, all kinds of different things. So if you are interested and want to stay connected with us, uh, we promise not to spam you. Uh, if you want to share your email address in the chat or private message me, or if you want to send it maybe to uh, Carolyn or, or to, uh, to Tisha, like whatever you think is best, um, but we'd love to have you stay connected with us. I'm sorry to, to, to ask if this, See, I'm, I'm very involved in my library association and we have a group now. It's the, um, um, the library staff of color. And we are looking for um, programming that's a little out of the box. And I, I, I mean, I'm the only one from Long Island that is, that's at this meeting. Um, and I would love to bring this to their attention so um, I think they would be fascinated with this because right now, of course, the concentration is a lot of um, black topics, but we do have a lot of librarians on Long Island 
that are not just black or, or, or of course white. I am actually Asian, but um, so this would be something that would I would love to have you do a program. And I will contact them and let them know that this this is this is just I'm I'm just fascinated by this. I, I unfortunately I think you're a little uh, you're not well known so. <laughs> We we'll that put on a nap. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mamie. Yeah, definitely hit us up. We'd be happy to work with your with your community, whether it's a workshop or some type of cultural program. We have a lot, as as you've seen, we have lots of different options. So happy to happy to connect with you in in the in the near future. And thank you, Tisha, for saying that. If if you want to send your email information to Tisha, she can pass it on to. Uh, Elizabeth and I, if that if that's more comfortable or if that makes you makes it easier for you. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate your presentation. It was fascinating. Our pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. Of course. All right. Well, if there's no final questions, um, I we will uh, again. Thanks everybody so much for your time and for um, uh, for having us here. And again, please see the museum as a resource. And we look forward to uh, working with you all in the near future. Thank you.